and over time you'll get more and more comfortable try new things and if it doesn't work it doesn't work but there's no sense of ego attached to it you're just playing to play and you're playing something no one else has told you to play and then when you leave you have this sense of confidence because all you're doing is learning how to speak and you created something that no one else has created because everyone else is different. When we have balance, we are in harmony with our best selves. We no longer seek approval for those that could care less about the pursuit of our life goals. We no longer depend on the vices that damage our body and mind to provide us with temporary distractions from making progress. And we are less likely to be victims of depression, obesity, and anxiety. Balance can look like many things and can become deceptive. Yes, that person looks healthy, but they are starving themselves to get there. Yes, that person is getting straight A's, but they have no time for themselves or the things that they really enjoy. Yes, that person has a nice house and the latest, coolest gadget phone, but their parents work 24-7 and like to buy their happiness with things. The thing about balance is that it's internally rewarding, but it's not something that is common throughout society. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what does this have to do with music? And my answer to you would be everything. I don't care how many rudiments you have memorized. I don't care how many all state scale patterns you can play on command. I don't even care how flawless your mallet technique may be. Without balance, that means nothing because you're depriving yourself of a life well lived. You'll either burn out due to nonstop hustle mode, or you'll lose the pureness of music itself due to being fatigued, overwhelmed, and anxious. What's the point of making music if you can't enjoy the life that is supported because of it? No matter what you build, an unstable foundation will always remain unstable. I'm really excited for today's topic on balance. I wish I had it earlier as a musician and earlier just as a person because it wasn't until balance was in the center of my focus that I could really grow and feel confident as a person and accept my strengths and weaknesses and not feel so timid, anxious, and mad, overwhelmed, stressed because balance helped me get to a place of of clarity and calmness and I can't wait to talk more about it for those of you that are part of the private podcast for those of you that are not we're going to go ahead and get to our practice tip but first check out what I got in the practice room it's a little different so I'm excited to share it with you all right I'm in front of the marimba I'm so excited I haven't been able to be in front of a marimba for long periods of time or do four miles in a while so I'm so excited to be able to just explore four mallets again i have this um this solo that i've never touched before and i got um it's like 11 now i have until like 120 until i have to leave so we're just gonna see the kind of progress i can make on this solo and I'm just so excited it's 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 from uh, mark ford's marimba T uh, technique through music book and this is called bonnie bray so i hope you have fun going through this journey with me. Let's go.
it's time for the tips and tricks segment of this podcast. Now we're going to be talking about the structure of practice. And there are four stages to a practice. To me, four stages of a really good practice session. And I want to dive into this so much that the next four episodes are going to be devoted to these different four ideas, these different four stages. So we've done a lot in mindset uh, recently with these first three podcast episodes. Now we're going to get more practical and I'll make sure that you have hands-on things that will definitely rewire the way you think about practice, the way you think about developing yourself as a musician. So let's go ahead and talk about these four stages. Stage one is shallow work. Stage two is deep work. Stage three is journaling. And stage four is creative. Now we're going to be talking big picture on these concepts because if we dive into one of these, yes, even one of these, I will just go on and on and on. So I want to make sure that we get the big picture before we get into the next four episodes that talk more specific about each one. So first with shallow work, I want you to visualize a pool for this process. When you start, you you just, you're dipping your toe in, right? You're just doing, you're doing a little bit. You're in the shallow end. You're not doing much. It's not, when it comes to practice, it, this is non-creative. This is something our body already knows how to do. It's like walking. When you walk, you don't think, okay, I'm taking my left step. I'm taking my right step. I'm taking my left step. No, you just walk. You just go. You just go. That's how I want you to perceive this first part. It's very much a warm up for your body. It's like stretching for a percussionist. We're doing nice big movements, nice and slow. We're stretching out those muscles. And this is going to be super crucial for making sure that we're one, doing the best for our body to be able to not have damage long term. And two, make sure that we're mentally transitioning from whatever we're doing into the practice mode for us to be able to then go into the deep area of this. Now, deep work is where we're going to experience the most growth. This is going to be the area that you develop something that you do not yet have comfortable. You are in your uncomfortable zone, your stretch zone, as I like to call it. So that means you're reaching out for that thing that you want to become better at. You want to become part of your shallow work component, but it's not there yet, right? So this is very important for you to know what's that thing that I can't do yet that I want to be able to do in order to successfully execute what I need to as a musician. It's going to be different for everyone at every single stage. What I need to work on in my deep work session is different from what you need to work on in your deep work session, right? But realize this is the part that really makes us grow our comfort zone from now being comfortable in this small area. We're now comfortable in this large area with very diverse approaches on every single instrument. And now when we get a piece of music in front of us or we're listening and playing with other people, we don't face as many obstacles as we did in the past, right? And every single obstacle is an opportunity for growth. Whenever you face an obstacle, write it down right away because that is gonna be a component of your deep work practice session. The third stage, we have journaling. And this is gonna be our go-to place to recognize what our shallow work component is and what our deep work component needs to be. So when we journal, we reflect, we review, we think through, okay, what are the things I'm doing? What went well? What didn't go well? What do I need to focus on next? So many people skip this stage, but this is the most crucial stage because without reflecting, you don't really know how you did. And you're just hoping that your brain retains everything, but your brain is not very good at remembering every single little thing you've ever needed to know. Think about how overwhelming that would be for your body. Instead, it forgets the things that are not relevant to make space for the things that you are learning right now that seem very, very relevant, which is why so many subjects in school, it's hard for us to remember those things long term because we don't see the relevance in our day to day lives. So when you journal, when you reflect, you're writing down the things that are very relevant to where you are in life as a musician right now. And then next time you practice, you pick up 
your journal, you, you open it up, and then you are automatically triggered by those things that you wrote down. You automatically start remembering it. You're like, oh, yeah, that thing. Oh, yeah, that thing. But it's very less likely that you'll remember those things if you just hope you remember it and then wait until you practice next time. You don't want it to feel like a blank slate when you practice. And when you see what you've written down, it's like you're picking back up where you left off, right? It's just like this pause and play. It doesn't feel like you stopped, you waited, and now you're coming back and you have to figure it out all over again, which means now you're going to start your practice way faster because your momentum doesn't seem to have stopped because you have this thing to trigger what you've already done and you just pick it back up and go. In the last mode, is to forget everything about shallow work, forget everything about deep work, forget about what your reflection was, and just create music. This is your ability to just speak music much like you speak the words you've learned throughout life. This is not premeditated, you just create. And so that means you pick up your sticks and you play on the snare drum. You pick up your mallet and you play on the marimba, play on the bells, play on the vibes. Uh, Put a five minute timer, a 10 minute timer, and just hit things. Just speak the words you have learned so far. And you're gonna notice this doesn't sound very good, or hey, that actually sounds kind of cool. And I just want you to get creative. I want you to create as a musician because as a musician, you are learning a language and you need to know what it feels like to speak it without other people telling you what to say. That is the beauty of language is now you have built this vocabulary of ideas, of patterns, of sounds, and you want to be able to explore it and navigate it much like a, a, a journey, uh, an awesome adventure. You create something out of nothing. It is a wonderful experience, and I find that it's the best way to finish a practice session because you can't really create wrong because it's all it's all you, right? So nothing can be bad from the experience other than you learning what it feels like to speak. And over time, you'll get more and more comfortable, try new things, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but there's no sense of ego attached to it. You're just playing to play. And you're playing something no one else has told you to play. And then when you leave, you have this sense of confidence because all you're doing is learning how to speak and you created something that no one else has created because everyone else is different. Your ideas are going to be yours and you need to know how to speak them. So go ahead and continue with our awesome practice session. So now I'm going to do something that I should have done more in the past is I'm going to stop there. That section, that first page into that transition, I stopped there and I decided to go back and get it comfortable and just get it comfortable through repetition, get consistency, think about how does this feel? What kind of shapes can I make? Can I get bigger? Can I get softer? And now that's all I'm going to look at on this piece today because... Normally, I'd keep trying to jam notes into my in my body, into my mind, and then I risk qual uh, quantity over quality. Because the next time I come back to it, I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be thinking about so much stuff. But uh, if I only have a small amount to think about, and to me this feels comfortable, if I have this amount to think about when I come back, I'm much more likely to be able to reproduce it. But if I'm forcing too much information into my brain at once, then most likely it's not going to be retained as much as I would like to. So the more you try to retain, the least likely that you're going to have a success in getting the same quality out. So now I'm going to go to something else. Near the end of my practice session, I'm going to come back to it, try to just 
see what my mind can remember, try to go from top to bottom, and there's most likely going to be holes because we can get under this illusion that once we practice something 25, 30, 50 times in a row, that that last product is going to be our our current state, but that's not correct because when we come up and play a solo, we don't get 25 times in front of the audience. We get one. So later on, I'm going to give my body a realistic idea of what it feels like after I have time away from it and I only got one run through where I don't have as much context as I've had just going 50 times in a row. And that I'm going to record, put into my notes, and then I'm going to listen to it next time I come back to it or listen to it just away from the marimba. And then when I come back to it, I'll have that last rep fresh in my mind. And then we will continue in the next podcast episode. So now I'm going to go to something else and I will do a quick run through later on. I changed up so much. I went from four mouths to two mouths. I changed key signatures from E major to D flat major. Don't worry if you don't know what I'm talking about. And I also uh, changed into 4-4 from this triplet 6-8 feel on Bonnie and Bray, the four mallet piece. So I'm demonstrating active recall. It's a very, very great strategy for getting things ingrained into your body properly. This is kind of like the way when you take tests and you're having to try to pull apart the information without much reference. That's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to show a raw idea of what my body remembers and what I can initiate on command. And it might not be very good. It might be better than I think. Last time you heard me was when I had a lot of repetitions, had a lot of run-throughs. Now, I just worked on the etudes, so now I'm showing you just raw. This is what it's it. This is what it is. And to prove it, I'm just going to, like, set it down. I'm, like, this is just going to be it. Pick it up, and I'm going to show you what I can actively recall. Definitely high, highly recommend you do this within your practice session yourself. Yes? All right. As you can see, there was a transition that I didn't feel comfortable with. And this is this is where my body has this, right? This is the authentic version, not, not sugar-coated. I don't have comforts, right? I don't, I, I'm not able to rely on 25 repetitions, 50 repetitions, 100 of these ideas and picking them apart and putting them together. That was it. And that's act. That's active recall, and that's a way to show you realistically where you're at in your music. And so now I know exactly what to focus on, so I'm going to use that recording to put into my notes, and then I'm going to, I'm going to reflect, review, and guide my next practice session off of that recording. Not the not the one that I felt comfortable with, but with that one, because that one is the true version of where I'm at on this piece. Awesome. Man, I, I hope you had fun. I'm having so much fun. And that's that's it for this practice. If you're listening to this and you're not a member of the private podcast over at the Chandler Studio, where we have two more segments. We have our lesson segment where we take our philosophy and apply it very clearly with a lesson to our lives. And then we have our ear training segment where we will develop our understanding of melody and rhythm together. 
If you're enjoying what I have to show you so far, then I highly recommend you checking out the link in the description on YouTube and the link in the show notes on the podcast. And if you really like this, then it only gets better from here. This is the Chandler Studio, and remember that skill matters, but effort always counts twice. Momentum by Patricia Islas. This is Chapter 2, A2, Number 3.